So Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 32. It says, There were also two others, criminals, led with Jesus to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. We talk fairly often about how forgetful we are. How we forget the things we should remember, but also how we have a tendency to remember the things we should forget. God is so aware of our forgetfulness that He has made a way for us, not just to remember, but also for us to be reminded. He's given us His Word to hide in our heart, reminding us of His character and the Holy Spirit to live in us to remind us of His Word. He gave Israel the festival so they could remember what he had done and to remind them of the promises that were still going to be fulfilled. He told Joshua to set up stones of remembrance so they could be reminded and then teach the next generations of how God had done all that he promised that he would do in their lives and for them. Moses instructed Israel to teach their children and talk with each other about God's law, to even write it on the doorposts of their houses and to wear it on the frontlets between their eyes. Both Peter and Paul wrote that it was not a difficulty but a joy to remind God's people of God's truth. Peter went so far as to say, I will refresh your memory as long as I live. Forgetfulness is only a weakness if we have no one willing to remind us of what we need to remember. What if our forgetfulness is just one more opportunity for us to depend upon God? What if it's just one more opportunity for us to trust Him and discover how much value He has placed upon us? I've shared it before, one of my character flaws that I am actively praying that God will work in changing in me is that fresh forgetfulness frustrates me. I don't like to have to give reminders. It makes me feel like I wasn't listened to the first time or like my words are not valuable enough to be remembered. But I'm learning that that frustration comes from my own security, but even insecurity, excuse me. But even worse, my frustration ends up creating insecurity in those that are asking me to remind them. See, that's the point. While I'm asking others to remember, God's asking me to remind. While I'm judging the forgetfulness of others, God is graciously covering my own forgetfulness with his own reminders. It's not just that he's patient and understanding. It's that he genuinely rejoices in our dependence upon him. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about the two thieves on the cross. There was one who railed against Jesus, demanding that Jesus prove himself and use his power the way he thought it deserved to be used. But the other made one simple but profound request. He asked to be remembered. Two men in the same place for the same reason with the same opportunity. One made demands, the other made a request. One refused to acknowledge his own weakness and the other reached out for help. One just would not be weak. But the other was able to rest in someone else's strength. I'm praying this morning that we'll stop fighting our own forgetfulness and that we'll discover the joy of not only being reminded, but being remembered by God. While we are forgetful, the Bible tells us over and over again that God remembers. What does that mean? 
See, we've been taught that God is omniscient, meaning that he knows all things. The Proverbs tell us that both wisdom and knowledge come from God. Isaiah 46 verse 10 says that God knows and declares the end from the beginning. If God already knows, what does it mean for him to remember? In Hebrew, there is a word that is used often to describe God's remembrance. God remembered Noah after the flood. He remembered Rachel and her barrenness. He remembered his covenant with Israel in their slavery. The Hebrew word is zakar, and it means to mark as to recognize. So when God remembers, it's not because he forgot it's because we've been marked and we are forever recognized. Because isn't that our biggest fear? That we'll just be forgotten? That we'll be overlooked, that we'll be set aside, that we won't be remembered. Isn't that why we work so hard hoping to leave a mark, to make an impression, or even to improve ourselves? This thought that we could be forgotten, that we need to be memorable, has a way of leaking into our understanding and our beliefs about God. So sometimes we find ourselves praying to get God's attention. We do good things, hoping to win God's favor. We have a list of things we don't do because those things might cause us to be forgotten or excluded. And then we have a list of things we do because we're hoping that it will, they will elicit some sort of blessing. That when our praises go up, that his blessings will go down. We live with this great fear, whether it's known or recognized, conscious or unconscious, that we will be forgotten. When God remembers, he's not calling something back that had slipped away. He's showing us his constant presence and his unwavering promise. When God remembers, it's to remind us that we will never be forgotten. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, it tells us that God remembered Noah and the waters receded. See, the rain lasted 40 days and 40 nights, but Noah and his family were in the ark for nearly a year. That's how long the flood lasted. We, we get that 40 days and 40 nights stuck in our head. That's just how long that the rain fell and that the springs let off water, but the flood itself lasted for nearly a year. Can you imagine what it was like to be in the ark? Yes, there was initial thanksgiving for being spared, but as the rain continued, and then as the waters slowly receded, there had to be at least moments of fear and of worry, even of panic. Will we ever get out of here? Will the waters ever go down? Will God remember us? You and I might not have ever been through a flood like Noah has, but we all have situations in our lives where God did something in our lives but didn't finish the work yet. And we have those seasons in between when he starts and when he finishes where we worry that he forgets. Where he hands us the beginning of the race, but then he tells us that the race won't end for a while and we worry all along, will he remember, will he remember, will he remember... And what he wants us to know is he never forgets. Genesis chapter 8 tells us that God remembered Noah and his family, and he stopped the rain, he receded the waters, and he settled the ark. God's remembrance, remembrance us, of us makes a way for us. When he remembered Rachel, he opened her womb, giving her children when she, when she had been barren. When he remembered Israel and their slavery, he set them free and led them to the promised land. When God remembers, he reminds us that we are marked, that we are loved, and we are chosen. When he remembers, he makes a way for us where we had no way of our own. Sometimes his remembrance has to first take away all of our own way so that we can remember and be reminded that God does more than our way. He moves in more more than our strength. And so sometimes there is this space in between, not where God's not busy, but what he's busy doing is taking away our options so that we'll know that we have received his promises, that we have been given his power. Every time in our lives that a door opened that we couldn't open ourselves, that a call came just when we needed to hear someone's voice, every time that our foolishness was overcome and goodness we didn't deserve was received, it was God remembering us. It was God showing us that we are marked and reminding us that He is good. There's more to this, though, than just God making a way where there is no way. When God remembers, He gives of Himself. See, God's nearness is not his proximity, it's his character. When he remembers, he shows us that he is and has always been close to us, that he chooses to walk with us. 
When Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't wait for them to come to their senses, to realize they're wrong, to humble themselves, or to beg for forgiveness. God himself came to them that day, just as he had done all the other days. See, our failures do not change God's character. And sometimes there are ways in which God works, in which it's our failures that allow us to see God's character even more clearly. We see God's mercy in him coming to Adam and Eve. We see his patience in the fact that he persisted with Abraham, even when Abraham continually made decisions based on fear of others and a weariness in the waiting. God showed his faithfulness in exposing David's sin when David was content to hide it and just live the way he had been living. But then God even offered forgiveness when David was willing to repent. We see God's love in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were the enemies of God, God sent his son to pay for our sins. We started the war with God, and rather than God defeating us, he adopted us. The Father didn't send His Son to repentant sinners. He didn't send Jesus to people who were sorry for their sin or even aware of their sin. God didn't respond to our cries for help, to our sudden moral awareness. He responded to His love. And so Jesus came to sinners that were pleased with their sin, people who were content with their rebellion and even unaware of the distance that they had placed between Him and themselves. <coughs> God remembered that he created us in his image and for fellowship with him. He remembered that we were foreknown and predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, to be like Jesus. God remembered doesn't mean that he ever forgot. It means that as the one who never forgets, he chose to make a way for the forgetful to be reminded. He chose to be the way. He gave himself for us. And so when we're remembered by God, it is not this sudden reaction. It is his constant moving toward us when we have moved ourselves away from him. The Gospels tell us that when Jesus was crucified, he was not alone. There were two others being crucified alongside him. Matthew and Mark both refer to these two men as robbers or thieves. Luke calls them criminals. Jesus had come to the cross by obedience to the Father. These other two men had arrived there by disobedience to the Roman law. Now, personally, I'm not one that believes in capital punishment, so I can't say that these men deserve to be crucified, but I will say that they chose their crimes knowing the possible and probable outcome. They were not dying unjustly. They were dying for their own crimes, for their own sins. Luke wrote that one of the criminals blasphemed Jesus. In this context, context, it means that he railed against Jesus. He hurled insults at him. He took his anger out on Jesus. Isn't it funny how we can choose not to believe in God, not to surrender our lives to Jesus, not to be obedient, and yet still be angry with God when our lives are not what we had hoped that they would be? We give him no credit for the goodness that he gives to us, and yet we're willing to blame him when things don't go the way we think that they should. And so this one thief who had lived outside of who God is decides that as he hangs on this cross, he'll show his anger with God by hurling insults at Jesus. He yells at him, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. This may be hard for some of us to accept, but the ultimate rebellion is when we demand that God prove himself to us for our sake. See, the God who created us, who breathed life into us, who made the world around, world around us so intricate, so delicate and specific, that it screams that there is a creator responsible for all of this. The God who the sun, moon, and stars declare in majesty. The God who didn't just create the world and then let it go, but holds it all together as our actions continually cause it to spin out of control. The God who dem demonstrated his love for us by sending his only son to die for our sins, and then demonstrated his power by having the same son rise from the dead three days later. What could be more rebellious than for us to demand proof from the God who has already proved himself? But notice what the man did. He didn't just say, prove yourself. He was saying, prove yourself by doing what I want you to do. Get me out of this. If you're God, save me from my own consequences. That's where too many of us live. We want God to do what we want Him to do. We want Him to serve us rather than for us to recognize that we must serve Him. And here's the rub. It's all lies. 
We won't serve God if He does what we want Him to do. We'll just find another reason to live for ourselves. That's what we see in the Scriptures so regularly. The Pharisees asked Jesus to do a sign when He'd done countless miracles and taught astounding truths. Even the day of His crucifixion, as Jesus was being crucified, there were people shouting to Him that if He's really the Messiah, just come down, save yourself, call angels to be your help. These were people that had seen miracles, that knew someone that had been healed, that might have even eaten from the miraculous meals that Jesus had provided. These were people that had watched His tenderness and seen His mercy, that had heard Him teach with a combination of love and authority that had never been imagined before. And then they decided to demand proof. Do more than you've done already. Do what I want you to do. Guys, don't we do the same thing at points in our lives? Where we live our own lives and we get to our own consequences and then we say, God, do this for me now. Change this for me now. Act this way now. And we say, and then I'll serve you. And let me be honest, it's a lie. It's a manipulation. It's an effort to just get our way. It's not a surrender and a submission. It is still us being in charge where we say, if you do what I want, I'll give you what you asked for. And that's not who God is. And in my mind, it is not sincere seeking. It is arrogant rebellion. God doesn't answer our demands. He doesn't negotiate with terrorists. He also never stops showing His love and offering Himself to us and for us. And so what He is asking for is not that we ask for what we want, but that we acknowledge who He is. You are God, and you can do whatever you desire. Here's what I think I need, but what I want more than anything else is to place myself in your hands. What we see in the scriptures, Jesus didn't respond to any of this. But the other man that was dying next to Jesus did. He rebuked the first criminal, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. The second criminal humbled himself. Maybe it took the cross, it took death before he would do it, but he humbled himself, and when he did, he saw Jesus differently. He saw Jesus as he actually was. See, as you hear me say often, when we are in God's presence, there are two things that become clear. Our condition and God's character. When we continue to hide or deny our condition, we reject God's character. That's what happened with the first man. He refused to deal with his heart, so he lashed out against God. Can I tell you this honestly? Anyone that lashes out against God is covering their own issues. They are deflecting from themselves to God. This is why it's not necessary for us to defend God or enter into these sort of debates and arguments. The accusations of the angry are really only their efforts to use fig leaves to cover their own nakedness. Let God work. He's patient. He's even long-suffering. He's not easily offended. He's slow to anger and he's rich in love. He continues to give grace. And if today you're here listening, and if your heart is hard, God will work to soften it. If your heart is wounded, God will work to heal it. But true change always requires honest introspection and a humble response. God's not going to act because we demand it. But God is acting to change our demands. To reveal the condition of our hearts so that we can rely on the purity of His character. When the second man stopped hiding his sin, he saw Jesus' beauty. I believe he saw Jesus' love. He made no excuse. He gave no explanations. He did not even confess. He just made one request. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He asked for what we all want, to be remembered, to not be forgotten, to be embraced when we fear we deserve to be rejected, to be wanted when we feel completely unworthy. In God's presence, he was completely aware of his condition, and so he appealed to God's character. This is all salvation has ever been. Salvation has always been and always will be when, the flawed, and failed, when flawed and failed people put their hearts and their lives in the hands of a loving and remembering God. 
Today, we don't have to prove us for how we're going to do better in the future. We just must acknowledge Jesus' lordship and ask him to remember us. We all have sins that need to be confessed and hearts that need to be changed. But salvation is not given when we get our act together. Salvation is given when we put ourselves in God's hands. When we stop fighting against the one who has already marked us and desires to remember us. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 begins this way. And you were dead in your transgressions and sins. When we look at the thief, we see this as some sort of deathbed salvation, some sort of deathbed conversion. He was about to die and he cried out to Jesus. But the truth of Scripture is that every salvation is not just a deathbed conversion, it's a resurrection. Paul said we were already dead in our sins. Our destiny was already written. Our outcome was set in our own stone. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3.18 that anyone that does not believe in Jesus as the Son of God is condemned already. See, there is this misconception. We say that Jesus came to keep us from going to hell, but that's not the truth according to Scripture. According to John 3 and Ephesians 2, we were already dead in our sins. We were already condemned in our unbelief. Our punishment was already established. Jesus didn't keep us from hell. He brought us back from hell. He changed our current and our eternal position. He didn't just give us a final destination in heaven. He changed eternity from the moment we cried out to Him for all Oh, forever we have been changed. And so this is part of the gospel that we need to preach better. If you're not in Christ, you're dead in your sins already. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're already condemned for your unbelief. And so it's not just that Jesus died and was resurrected. Jesus died because we're dead already. And when he rose again, he brought us back with him. And so there's this point in our understanding of the gospel that Jesus isn't intercepting us. He's breathing new life. Because we're already dead. Amen. That's offensive to most of us. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for most of us. We want to think of our sins as mistakes, as errors of judgments, of things that we did wrong. But here's the truth of the scripture. You and I were dead in our sins. Yes. We could not get better or be better or do better. Mm -hmm. We were where we were going to be. Andrew. And then Jesus didn't just die, yes, amen. he brought life back to the dead. That's what salvation really is. It's not giving you a place for eternity. It's bringing you back from your eternal place and changing everything. The criminal asked to be remembered, and Jesus responded, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You will be. Be with me. Jesus didn't have to think about the request. He didn't have to work to remember. He didn't have to interrogate or even investigate to see if the man was sincere, if he was really sorry for his sin, or, and if he was ready to be saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, Today is the day of salvation. Every day is the day of salvation. There is nothing left to be done. God is prepared to save us. Mm -hmm. Jesus has done all the work. We are never waiting on Him. He is ready, willing, and waiting for us. When the prodigal son finally came home, he had prepared a story, he had prepared a speech, an apology that he hoped would persuade and convince his father to forgive him. But what he found was that the father did not need to be convinced. When the, as the prodigal son came, he found out that his father had been waiting for him all along. He lived in a constant state of preparedness for the day when his son might return. He had no guarantee that his son would come back, but he had made a decision. If he comes back, he will find me ready. If he ever wants me, he will find out that I always wanted him. If he ever decides to ask for forgiveness, he will discover I've already forgiven him. If he ever thinks he lost his place, he will come back and find out that I kept his place when he stopped being a son in his mind I kept being a father in mine wow. because the Amen. father determines the relationship wow. children go their own way but fathers hold fast mm -hmm. and so when the son finally decided to come home his father saw him from a long ways off because he had never stopped watching to see if he might come home 
He, the son, the father ran to the son because he couldn't even think about another minute away from his son. He wasn't going to wait for him to get there. He decided, I'm going to meet him in the middle because I don't want to waste any more of these seconds. He told the servants to kill the calf that he had kept ready for this day, to get the robe and the ring and the sandals that he had kept ready for this very moment. When the son denied the father, the father just kept loving his son because relationships are not defined by the rebellious. They are defined by the faithful. And God always remains faithful Amen. to our hearts, no matter how far from him we may have roamed. Jesus' answer to the thief is what salvation is. It's not about going to heaven. It's about being with Jesus. That's what we were created for. That's why we were born. That's why we were thought of in the mind of God. Simply to be with Him now and forever. This is why we are remembered. And it's how we have been marked. Simply to be with Him. That's what happens at salvation. Go back with me for a minute to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1 begins, And you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And then verse 4 picks up and says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Or as you watch today, you can be saved. And raised up with Him and seated, and seated us in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We were dead in sin, but God didn't give up on His love. We were far from Him, but He stayed close to us. We rejected Jesus, but He embraced us. We forgot Him, but He has always remembered us. Here's what I want us to see as we finish today. If this thief was not dying next to Jesus, he would have never had the opportunity to be saved by Jesus. It was not chance that set these men next to Jesus on the day he was dying. It was providence. It was the will of God. It was the desire of God. It was the love of God. And you and I may sit here and say, how could the love of God lead them to being executed for their crimes? The love of God led them to a moment in the presence of God. Even when everything was caving in, they got to see him as he was. The love of God decided that I want them to have an opportunity to know me. To be with me forever. These men were remembered by God. He had marked them. And so God ordered even their last moments to be spent in His presence. Think of that. Men who had rejected God their entire lives. God ordained. In your last moments you'll spend them with me. Because whether you want me or not, I have always desired you. Whether you were the prodigals that ran away, I am the father that stays yes. sure. And so God ordered their lives not to end, but for new life to be offered, even in what they thought were their last moments. In that, one man refused to be remembered. He rejected the love that he was being offered. But the other man, he understood that this was not chance, but this was God's desire. He could have been executed any other day. He could have been caught for crimes long before he was finally arrested. But he had been marked, and so his life was given every opportunity to be surrendered to Jesus. As you are watching with us today, as you are listening today, I don't know what has happened or what is happening in your life, but I believe this. God is working to bring you the salvation that He has prepared for you, that He has kept for you, and that He will not give up on you. He's not put punishing you. He's remembering you. He knows our hearts. He knows what will get through to us, what will move us, what will bring us to a place of trusting His love and depending upon Him for our lives. The worst day of this man's life brought him to the place where he saw Jesus in all of his beauty and all of his glory and where he received the eternal love he had spent his entire life rejecting. Can I ask you to just think about where you are? Where your family is? What's happening in your work? What's happening in your heart and in your mind? What's even happening in our world and in our, in our community? I don't know the specifics of where you are today, but I do know this. God is there with you. And if you will if simply ask to be remembered, if you will submit your heart, your hope, and your life to Jesus, not only will He be where you are, but you will be with Him forever. 
Salvation is not for those who have it all together. It's for those who have put who put it all in Jesus' hands and believe that they will always be remembered. Whatever you're going through today, God's going through it with you. And he may just be leading you through it so that you will meet him because you've stayed far from him. And so I want to encourage you today. You can't do enough good deeds to change your direction. You can't say enough prayers to make everything better. You can't go to church often enough to change your attitude and your heart's desire. But what you can do is believe this. Jesus is with me and Jesus is for me. And all Jesus wants is me. He'll deal with whatever's broken. But we have to put our brokenness in his hand. See, three days after Jesus died for our sins, died for all sins, yours and mine and the two men that hung next to him, he showed that sin had no power over him and he rose, he literally resurrected from the dead. If sin has no power over Jesus, then if we put our lives in Jesus' hands, it will no longer have power over us. And that is the great gift of salvation. It is not where you spend forever. It is that in the here and the now, sin can lose its grip on us if we will let go of our grip on sin. Because if it cannot hold Jesus, and Jesus holds us, how could it ever continue to have a grip in our lives? Today we can be free. We can be saved. We can be remembered because we have always been loved. And so I invite you today to love Jesus because he first loved you. To give him your life and to discover the joy of being remembered, of being marked, and of being chosen. I don't want this to sound dramatic, but here's how I need us to see it. All of us are those two feet. Because all of us are dead in sin and dying for sin. And yet Jesus has invested in himself in us so deeply that he stands with us in our death. And so today I ask really honestly, which thief will we choose to be? Will we be the one that blames God for life not being what we want it to be? The one who argues with God about what he should be doing and the timing of when it should be done? Or will we be like the second thief that will simply stand there and say, just remember me? I've been wrong. I've been far off. I've been foolish. I've been rebellious. I don't even know what I should be, but I know it's not this. And so remember me. Are we willing to humble ourselves enough that we would stand in Jesus' presence today, wherever we may be, and say, thank you for dying for my sin. Forgive me of all of my transgressions. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I want you to have your way. Would you bow your heads with me today? Because I just want to pray for you and pray with you. And then after we pray, we're just going to briefly have a time of communion together where we will eat and drink in remembrance of the gift that Christ has given us. Heavenly Father, I thank you today that salvation is about relationship. I thank you today that all you want is us. And so I pray today that you would move in all of our hearts and all of our minds and we would set aside all of the trappings and all of the fears and all of the worries, all of the misconceptions. God, even the things that we have been wrongly taught, the things that we have been lied to about, may we just set it all aside and say, Jesus, I believe you are ordering my life just to get me to you. And so God, I pray today that you'd move in our hearts and that we would stop holding back and demanding proof from you. And we would just surrender and submit ourselves to you. I pray for anyone that's watching, that's wavering. I pray that they would know that there is no sin too great to be forgiven. That there is no distance too, law, too large to be merged. That there is nothing that you don't know already about their lives. And you've come to them anyway. May they be aware that you see their darkest places and you are the brightest light. That you see their deepest hurts and you are the healer of their hearts. That you know their most anxious thoughts and you will be their peace. May they know that you love them in this. And so you will even love them through it. And so I pray today for salvation to be our song. I pray today that you give us the courage to confess our need. And to believe that you have and will remember us. I pray that you'd work salvation in our hearts and in our lives today. In Jesus' name I pray.
Amen. I want to invite you to share communion with us today. For those that may have joined in later, I shared at the very beginning that communion is a solemn and a holy thing. But communion is not a formal thing. Communion is not something that has to be served, that has to happen in a church building. Communion is something that we do in God's presence to fulfill God's promise to us. That Jesus is with us. And that he's for us. And so I invite you today, if you have juice of any kind, if you have bread of any kind, I invite you to eat and I invite you to drink with us today. The only requirement to receiving communion is that you have submitted your life to Jesus. You don't have to be a part of this church or that church. You just have to have submitted your life to Jesus. And so if at any point, even this morning, if you have confessed your sins to Jesus and surrendered your life to him, you are worthy and eligible to receive communion today. But I will say this, communion is a serious thing. And the scripture says that we should not take it in a foolish manner, in a haphazard manner, but we should, should search our hearts. And so today, in just a moment, we're going to partake, but I'm going to give you about a minute where Veronica is just going to play in the background, and I'm going to give you about a minute to slow your life down and to search your heart. Pray this prayer if you don't know what else to pray. Search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. If there is anything in your life that you know doesn't belong, confess it to Jesus before you eat and before you drink. If there is any part of your life that you know he has been seeking to change, confess that you desire change to him before you eat and before you drink. It is a serious thing to take communion, but it is also a simple thing. If our hearts are open, his body and his blood are available to us. I'm going to give you about a minute just to sit in our quiet and to prepare, prepare our hearts and then we will eat and we'll drink together. On the night of Jesus' arrest, he ate the Passover meal with his apostles. That night he washed their feet. He showed them the full extent of his love. He taught them. He blessed them. He prepared them. And he gave them a command to love one another, even as he loved them, loved them himself. And then he sat down with them. And the book of Luke says, and he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus literally died so that we wouldn't have to. His perfect sinless body was broken so that our broken hearts and spirits could be made perfect. Lord Jesus, thank you for your body. Thank you for giving yourself for us. Thank you for the price that you paid. May we rightly remember, may we rightly remember today so that we can become the body of Christ without spot and without blemish. Let's eat together. The scripture says, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup, is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. See, the Bible says there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And so every year Israel made sacrifices. They had a day of atonement, a day when all sin was forgiven, but it was also a day when all sin started again. And yet Jesus in his perfectness, in his perfection, in his beauty, in his divinity and his humanity, when he shed his blood, Sin wasn't forgiven for a day. It was forgiven forever. 
And it wasn't just the sin of those who would drink that night. It would be every sin that was ever committed. That's why on the cross he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He wasn't just speaking about those there that day. He was going back to Adam and he was going forward to us. Because all of us don't realize, we don't really understand that when we sin, we're separating ourselves from God. And so as Jesus paid for all sin, as he shed his blood for all sin. So you and I don't ever have to shed our blood. To pay our penalty. We don't ever have to make a sacrifice. We don't ever have to know what it is to go and find a perfect lamb and lay it down on the altar and pray that its blood would be enough. Because the blood of Jesus has made us pure, has made us whole, has made us whole. Lord Jesus, I thank you today that your perfect blood has washed away all of my sins. I thank you today that I don't have to wonder which ones you'll remember, which ones will still take effect, which ones will still be held against me. Because today I know that you were sacrificed once for all. And so I thank you today that I'm not forgiven today, I'm forgiven forever. Thank you that my sin will not come back to haunt me. Thank you that it will never be used against me. Thank you that when I stand in your presence on that great day of judgment, you will see this blood of your Son rather than the darkness of my sin. Thank you that once we are made whole, we are whole forever. And so I pray today, not for your blood to have any power, but for us to dwell in the power of your blood. Amen. That we would live as those who have been forgiven. That we would live in great gratitude and we would live in holiness. Because not only have your wounds paid our ransom, but your blood has made us holy. Let's drink together. Lord Jesus, thank you for being willing. I pray today that we would humble ourselves enough to willingly submit to you, to throw ourselves to you, to cry out to you the way that one thief did. Remember me. Mark me. Recognize me. And so I pray today that you would mark all of us by your body and by your blood, that you would mark all of us by your love and your goodness, that you would mark all of us by forgiveness and redemption. Thank you for wanting to save us. May today we be willing to be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to finish in just a moment, but before we do, I just want to ask you today, if, you, if God is stirring your heart, if He's pulling on your heart, would you please send us a message? Let us know to pray for you, how to pray for you. If God drew you to that place of salvation today, please let us know so that we can encourage you and build you up in this. Jesus, he called us to himself, but he didn't call us to do it by ourselves. And so if you need prayer, reach out to us, leave comments, send a direct message. We will come back to you. Just a reminder today, uh, just a reminder for this week, we have prayer meeting tomorrow night. We have uh, Bible study on Wednesday night. Um, we'll have more video updates on Friday. Um, thank God for what he's doing. Thank God that he keeps us connected even while we feel far, far apart. But this Resurrection Sunday, we have a tradition um, here. We gather with other churches every uh, Easter Sunday down at the river in Burlington and have a sunrise service. And uh, a lot of us are missing that today. It's the first time in years that we haven't been down there together with Broad Street United Methodist Church, with the Way Church, with First Baptist Church of Burlington, and uh, St. Mary Street United Methodist Church, and others that join in year after year. And the way that we end that service every year um, as we go our own way, is to sing the hymn, He Lives. And so, it would not be Resurrection Sunday for me if we didn't finish our time together singing He Lives. So I've asked my wife, Melissa, she's going to come back, um, and she's just going to lead us through um, He Lives. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, He lives. 
Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He God bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. He is risen. He is risen indeed. God bless you.